live. Welcome, everybody, um, back to the Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center at CUNY. And to, today is a very special day for us. And of course, of course, all days have been inspiring. We had artists from uh, Hong Kong, China, Italy, Germany, from Taiwan yesterday, um, from uh, Italy, and uh, and so so many many others, Taylor Mack and Kristen Martin from New York for that great trickle up. NYC.org website where you can subscribe on a kind of a Netflix based uh, service to support artists. And um, we heard from um, really from people around the world, from Egypt, from Lebanon. But uh, today we have um, the, the um, enchanting and beautiful and uh, wonderful <laughs> Meredith Monk uh, with us, one of the sure. shamans like uh, she and Penny Smith and others who are like really the. Uh, who represent New York City, the spirit of New York, like really nobody else. And um, they are leaders in our field. Uh, their work is astonishing, uh, groundbreaking, uh, remained vibrant and alive over all the decades. And um, and um, she has been a good friend to the Siegel, has been with us. We ran in each other at the, the Nomad, at the great Nomad Library Cafe just a couple of weeks ago, and nobody thought of what would be now. So <clears throat> the Siegel talks are, are trying to create some meaning to know what's on people's minds and uh, what they are thinking. We hear from politicians, economists, virologists, but I think, and I feel strongly, we need to hear from artists. Uh, this is what it's all about. And since we can produce, we in our homes, we need a place to reflect the outside world, a stranger than fiction. And uh, well, we all are wondering, is cyberspace real or not? Now it's one of the few real things that do exist and there, how we can connect. So first of all, um, Meredith, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. You're so welcome. I was saying to Jackie earlier that, you know, it's so hard to figure out what we can give now as artists in this world. And, you know, I can't be in a hospital helping. So how can we give in, in, in this time and in our world? So mm -hmm. I feel like you know, making contact with people is something that I can give. Thank you, Meredith. So Meredith, how are you? Hanging in. <laughs> Some days better than others, but uh, you know, some days I feel that I'm just uh, drowning in sorrow. I do I work and people that I know dying and people that I know having the virus. And then, so that comes up and then I just try to acknowledge it and let it flow through. And then there are some days where I feel very inspired and I'm working on a new piece and you know, the days that I can center myself and do that, I really feel that, you know, this is what I'm meant to do. You know, it's sometimes, I think I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, the, dis, dis, the, the kind of distracted quality that we're all going through in a way, it's hard to keep the discipline. And yet every time I start working, I just feel that the joy and of discovery and creativity is the meaning of it, you know, like, this world, you know, will it really mean anything, um, you know, when we, we pass through this time? But I think the meaning of it is the joy of creativity and discovery, and and, and that's meaning enough. Mm -hmm. So, do you discover? Do you? Yeah, I'm mean, some days where I, you know, I'm working, as I said, on a new piece, and so I'm at the piano and or or working on ideas, and yes, I, I think that it is coming along little by little. For how long have you been personally, how have you been inside your loft? Uh, it's been th uh, three and a half weeks. So three and a half weeks, you have only uh, leave once a week or uh, once a day, I, how, what gone, do you do? Well, I've gone to the mailbox twice down the street. First time I just went to the mailbox and back, I had to, you know, I had to send in my rent check and in bills and everything and so, that was a very strange day because it was a cloudy and cold day mm -hmm. and really was like a ghost town. There was nobody on the street except mm -hmm. for one mailman and he was about half a block away and I, I yelled, thank you for your service. And then he didn't even look at me. He was waiting mm -hmm. <laughs> and I realized this is gonna really be quite an adjustment when we speak to each other face to face. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll probably still be a little bit of fear and discomfort, you know, along with the exhilaration of being able to be close to people again. So 
uh, that was that was sobering. And then the second time I went out was on Saturday again to go to the mailbox, and um, I allowed myself to walk around the block, and there were many people out there. So uh, it was a beautiful day. So again, I think um, that was a that made me feel good that people were out. But at the same time, I think in New York we have to be very careful about density of human beings. Um, I see. Yeah. So, um, like, as like good New Yorker, you don't have a mailbox in your building. You go out to the post office to get your mail. Well, I didn't go to the post office. That would be risky. <laughs> no. no mailbox. No, I have. We get our mail in the building, but if you want need to mail out your rent check, <laughs> you yeah. have to go to the mailbox. Yeah. Now you have to go to the mailbox and bring yeah. it. I I get it. I I understand it. So, um, and, and is, um, in your loft, you have been since. 1972 right yes so uh, as you said so you, have you have you ever spent such a, a long uninterrupted time there oh uh, you mean in, in terms of not going out at, yeah. on the street at all no <laughs> I never have. you normally tour you go out and and, and you sing um so how does it um, Im, Im, Im impact you uh, to be with your things and uh, with your mind and with your imagination, but having less input from the, from the outside world, you know, as we all experience now, how, what does it do to you? Well, I love solitude and I even, you know, I spend a lot of time in New Mexico where I'm really, really in what I would call retreat. So mm -hmm. first I thought that was going to be my long waited for retreat. When mm -hmm. this started, and um, you know, I was really, really, really busy uh, this whole fall and winter. It was kind of nonstop touring and doing. So mm -hmm. I actually thought this was going to be a retreat time, and I realized that it's not quite because part of the I think part of the beauty of this time is that we're making more contact with people, even if it's virtual contact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's very much part of and I've never been afraid to be alone. I love my solitude. Um, so it's now I realize that I have a kind of schedule. <laughs> and so I have to really make time where I say this whole day is going to be a, a day of silence and meditation and, and working at the piano. So I literally have to still really discipline myself to make those days that I am not going to make contact with the outside world because uh, mm -hmm. I love that concentration. Mm -hmm to um, to reach out to, to reach out yeah there is a difference between of course solitude and loneliness mm -hmm. but do, do you feel lonely at times no <laughs> i love yeah. my solitude <laughs> yeah i well i i did have one evening it wasn't loneliness exactly but you know before the lockdown in new york i guess i was more I don't know if I was in denial or I was more optimistic or out of contact. I don't know what, but you know, I, I was really, you know, I'm a Buddhist practitioner. So I was really working with fearlessness and blah, 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 you know, all these, these uh, principles. And then I got an email from my friend Ping Chong and he said, there's going to be lockdown and the national guards coming in. And then it suddenly hit me. I'm I'm totally alone in this loft, and here I am stuck in New York. And uh, if I were, were ill, per perhaps because of my age, uh, you know, I would just not be given the breathing mechanism. You know, it's sort of you everything falls away. So actually, a few days before that, all our engagements fell away. So it was this mm -hmm. really feeling of suspension and groundness that, as Buddhist practitioners, we actually try try for. And I feel like up to this time, that concept was rather abstract for me. And now I actually feel that we're living that in groundlessness, impermanence, um, uh, emptiness uh, in the sense, emptiness in the sense of everything changing and flowing. So that evening, I just had a kind of meltdown of, of real fear and, uh, you know, my mind going into all kinds of scenarios of doom, um, sadness that maybe this piece would never come to life, sadness that maybe I'd never perform again, just the whole scenario. And then I realized that I was very grateful that I went through that 
because it really gives me much more of uh, the sense of compassion for anybody who's has fear and is you know scared and uh and I, and I moved through it. I saw how our minds shift. You know, it's like that could come up maybe in moments and then it, it shifts to something else. And we all are part of this big flow of life. And so I'm glad that I went through that, you know, so, but other than that, I, I really don't feel lonely, you know, at all. So how does your day look like? You said you have a schedule or not, but how tell us what do you get up? Where do you go? What do you, how, you, the, you walk us through ideal, your day? I'll tell you the ideal day. It doesn't work yeah. out that way. All yes. the time. So the ideal day is I get up and then I do, uh, if I'm really together, I sit and, and meditate for about half an hour, mm -hmm. have my breakfast, and then I'll, I'll go and I'll go to the piano and work. Maybe first I'll vocalize a little bit and do some physical exercises and then go to the piano and work. And then after that, talk to, to people and find out how they're doing, answer emails, you know, that kind of thing. I've been very fortunate that, uh, so over the years I've done a wonderful practice, which I think everybody who's done this would acknowledge that it's a wonderful thing physically, which is Pilates. I've done that for many, many, many years. And mm -hmm. I have a wonderful teacher. So I've literally been taking private lessons with her twice a week here in my loft and then mm -hmm. she teaches one class a week and that just getting moving and and you know feeling my you know strength and flexibility has also really centered me and helped me a lot in this time and then vocalizing as well so doing physical physical work of just trying to stay healthy with the instrument has been very helpful mm -hmm. so then you have afternoon is a communication and dinner and then do you listen to music do you uh, watch, movies. watch movies yeah movies. Uh, read read uh, movies. movies tell me what did you see last uh, i'm a total movie freak uh i finally i finally saw a uh, pichot which is a classic brazilian film from 1980 i've been wanting mm -hmm. to see it for years and what a, i'm haunted by it you know it's a beautiful film so i've i've I really love film and film history. And so, um, and I just joined the Criterion channel, which- Right, yeah, I did too. Like, as, I, as, I, as I wrote to Ping, I, I said, it's like a, a feast for a starving person. Cause I don't yeah. even know where to begin. There's so many things I want to look at. So, you know, I'm a real fan of Japanese film, particularly some of the more obscure early films of some of the Japanese directors. So mm -hmm. they have some of those. And so I'm just thrilled. I mean, my big inspiration is, is film. It's film, yeah. It's a great, great service. I think it's also like Netflix, $10. It's criterionchannel.com. Um, but um, I, I'm interested in your, in your, your Buddhist practice and, and, and what you do. And maybe join a bit, let us know the meditation. Um, how, how do you do that? And um, you already went, but did it change? Did the meaning for it change? For you in these days you mean, you mean during the, these days yeah he, well i feel like i you know have a much more regular practice now because of this time in that i'm very grateful for that um in you know usually when i'm in new york i don't you know sometimes i'm just running around so much i i can't sit as much as i like to so in that way i am extremely grateful and um i mean it's hard to talk about these things but it's just a very simple patient practice which is the breath you know, going back to the breath. And there, there are many different variations. Um, and then I've been doing a practice that I received a long time ago, which is the Medicine Buddha practice. And that's more a chanting practice of just sending out energy for healing of the world. And it's in Tibetan and, you know, that's challenging um, and has been challenging to me. But I think the point is the aspiration that you're even by, by chanting these uh, you know this these syllables this text it's you know the idea is just uh sending out energy you know healing energy to the world and i think the basic philosophy is you know we all have to just start working with ourselves in any way that we can and then by doing that and being more aware of our proclivities or our you know or just being more familiar with our minds by working on ourselves, it's really like throwing um, a stone into the water and then it starts radiating out. You're, you're not sure of how that's working, but that's not the point. The point is you have to begin by learning how to be friendly with yourself 
before you can really, you know, be genuinely friendly with other people. So, and that's easier said than done. So I just, um, you know, just trying to stay centered and, and connecting. Mm -hmm. So in the mornings you sit on a, mm -hmm. you sit on a, you sit on a, on a cushion and you, I sit uh, on a, a, a little stool because I, I have a, my back, mm -hmm. I have back problems and, and then you breathe oh. and then mm -hmm. afterwards um, you do, you do think, I remember when you came to the Siegel and we talk, I often think about it. You said, you know, don't be afraid of the unknown. Um, well, that's what we're now. That, that, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's the thing that is amazing that, and that's a principle uh, because what I think is that we always are living in the unknown and we're always groundless and we're always, uh, groundless, not, not knowing what's going to happen next. And in the sense of change, and yet we're so busy that we're not aware of it. In other words, what I'm saying is this time is just magnifying the, the truth of what our reality is, because in fact, any time in your life, you don't know that you could be walking out on the street and a cap can hit you I actually know someone that that happened to and she died. Um, so in a way, we're just living in a very, very magnificent Way, what we're always living but we're just not aware of it you know because we're going a little faster in the reality of our obligations are you know what we do and everything mm. so in that way it's it's really amazing it's an amazing time mm. do you think we should be afraid now a little bit or you would still say don't be afraid i think it's more just uh using fear in a positive way of, of being more alert and being more careful and not and um, not dwelling in it, but letting it come and acknowledging that energy of it and the, the way that it wakes you up a little bit. And that's a natural thing or natural response to what's happening, but to just try not to spin spin around in it and, and dwell in it because I think that that energy is not useful right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite, it is devastating um, in New York. New York City has more, more deaths and more cases, you know, as a state than most countries in the world, or all of the countries in the world at the moment. Um, um, and I spoke with Melanie, Melanie Joseph yesterday, who was so devastated. Um, um, of course, next to Bernie, our great champion, got out of the race, but also um, of what is happening. We have five to six million people using a subway daily. We yeah. have, of course, one of the biggest airports. And of course, New Yorkers are so close. So of course, everything that makes New York so great now, in a way, works um, also against it. Uh, yesterday, Taiwan, is said how great they responded. It's an island nation, but they really prepared also in a way, but it is, it is really scary there. And, um, and Ben has almost like an end of times feeling. How, how is this for you? You mentioned uh, friends or sick or your family. Tell us a little bit of how, how, about your personal situation with your, with your community is fine so far they live all over the place my niece uh, Karina uh, right when the beginning of this started she went with her family and her husband upstate to some friends thinking that they were just going to get their bearings for the weekend mm -hmm. and they ended up staying there which is really great uh, and the rest of my family is uh, living in different places so they're doing well uh, there's two members of my ensemble that are ill but they are hanging they in are and they are infected yes who are they? Who are they? I don't want to mention their names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. but, but the dancers, um, uh, dancers, or one dancer, singers, singer dancer, and one yeah, two singer dancers, and then my assistant also had it early on, and so I was exposed to uh, three people, but it's been three and a half weeks since I've seen any of them, and so so far so good, and uh, yeah, so you know I I'm just very grateful that even though I was exposed. I don't, I think by that point we were washing hands and we weren't standing too close, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I feel, feel okay. And um, they are, seem to be improving. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry to hear that for your, for your uh, collaborators and also for you that in a way, as you said, what will I ever sing again? If something becomes very real, something we often think about, when does it end? And, uh, and um, uh, we often do say, when I die or if I die, but we will do, we will, you know, so, and this, of course, yeah. um, is a reminder, you know, that as you said, you know, we do not know what happens next day in the normal days where we wake up or not. 
So um, the question is, what, what, what do you think about making art now? And um, should we do, should we think about it? Uh, um, is your thinking changing? I feel you, you maybe is one who have always had that dialogue already in the normal days, but is something changing in your internal hard drive on the computer? Is there a little update running? Well, you know, I've, I've had my days during this time that I start to lose heart a little bit and uh, wondering, you know, what the meaning of making art is. And again, when this is, when we come through the end of this, will art, live art, which is something that I, you know, really, really believe in, you know, the power of live art, that we are all in the same room at the same time. Infinity sign of back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I still believe in that deeply. And I'm working on a new piece called Indra's Net, which is based on a Hindu slash Buddhist legend, kind of, I guess you would call it a teaching legend about connection and interdependence. And it's uh, the, and I've been working on it, thinking about it for 10 years. And then I started working on the music and 2014 and then made cellular songs uh you know which really felt like it needed to come to fruition earlier because indra's net is such a huge idea and um so i but i I've, I've been now i'm working on it and i had my i i during this time i've been teaching at harvard so you should know that i do mm -hmm. uh, once a week uh yeah. on mondays i teach a, co a music composition class and mm -hmm. a choral music class of uh, young, young young undergraduates that are learning my music. So I'm teaching with Katie Geisinger from my ensemble. We work together and um, the, the composition class I called interdependent, uh, I called uh, interdependent, interdisciplinary composition. So it's uh, graduate composers, but I'm also introducing them to visual ideas or ways to just open up their idea of making music and you know, just introducing other perceptual modes to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been really amazing, you know, to do it on Zoom and see all those beautiful faces in this grid and then trying to figure out problems that they could, you know, compositional assignments that they could fulfill. Some, uh, some frustration involved with that, but it's also pretty interesting, you know, to, to figure that out. So, uh, so that, um, and then part of the Harvard residency for me has, which was, has, was just so blessed and such a wonderful, wonderful thing was that they allowed me to work with my whole ensemble on this new piece for a week in uh, February um, at Art Lab, which is a new beautiful building that Harvard mm -hmm. has opened up. I mean, just couldn't be better. And we had one week, I had one week with my on, ensemble working on Indra's Net. Um, and last fall I had worked with students at Mills College because that's gonna be where the piece is gonna be performed first. They were instrumentalists. So this piece has eight um, singer, actor, dancers, um, and I think 16 or orchestra players. So mm -hmm. at last fall I was able to work with the instrumentalists at Mills and then had this wonderful week with That was incredible, incredible beginning. So no, you know, not being able to do that again, we were supposed to do it this week, as a matter of fact, that was pretty sad, you know? So that was part mm -hmm. of this thing of, you know, how do I keep this going? You know, how do I keep the inspiration going? Is this meaningful? Because the piece is so much descriptive, it's strangely enough, is so descriptive of what we're going through now because Indra's net, the concept of Indra's net is, the story is that there was an enlightened king and he lived in on this mountain and he made a net that covered the whole universe. And at each uh, intersection of the lines of the net was an infinitely faceted jewel, which reflected everything else in the universe. So every, every corner of that net is, or is an infinitely faceted jewel that reflects all the other infinitely faceted jewels in the universe. So it's really the concept of interdependence and connection. And my, my idea was so spatial because part of it was all, is, is going to be uh, an installation piece where people can walk through it and there are these points in the space. 
And I, I, even in the live part of it, I want to have the audience in different uh, in different configurations during the piece. So, you know, the live thing seems really important. I, I don't know if I can conceive of a virtual way of thinking about it at this point. Um, so I just feel that I just at, at a certain point had to this is very reflective of what we're going through right now. Uh, it's, it's a kind of prayer to the continuation of the earth. There are some sections that really have that, a sense of prayer and healing. And I feel that it's something that could be very hopefully healing to, to people even when this is over. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I really so do. Then I, then I go back to the piano and start working again, and I'm finding new ideas. And you know, it's and we're in other words, I'm I'm saying that we're just continuing on the process with the with the faith that it will come to life in the way that it needs to come to life. Uh, yesterday, I had a wonderful Zoom talk with my costume designer, but also real artistic soulmate Yoshio Yabara, who's I've been working with since the 1980. And we do a lot of conceptual thinking things through, you also spatially because he's also a scenic designer. So we had a talk and we are starting to work on the thinking about the costumes and just taking it step by step. And you know, with also knowing that the process itself is meaningful. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you spend also some time on restoring um, the film of Quarry, um, and mm -hmm. um, it was also a way a look back um, at, at your work and um, and about something that in a way is lost, that legendary time in New York City uh, when it was uh, being produced, uh, when you uh, found and created something and discovered also something. Um, if you look, when you looked at it again, even before this, what, what, what came to your mind? What, what were you thinking about? Also about the city of New York, the tremendous changes we went through, and this also will transform the city, but what, what came to your mind with the film? And do you see new connections with the time now? I, I think it's interesting that you, your response, even when we did the showing, was more about the time that, that it was made and the community that we had at that time. But I don't actually, Strangely enough, that's not the first thing that comes to mind when I look at the film. I guess what really shocked me about looking at it is how prescient it was and how it's so much about what's going on in this world. So, you know, I, I think of it more in those terms. Um, and then also how amazing each of the performers was in the, you know, in that film, such brilliant artists and how they were so uh, unique and, and inspired and, and just a, a way of thinking about things. So maybe that has a little bit to do what you're talking about. You know, there were a lot of principles that maybe we knew as a language of perception and, and performing uh, that it have probably changed now. Hmm. Maybe for example, Quarry has, yeah. Quarry is, it was done originally at the La Mama Annex, which was, is a huge, hundred foot long, I keep on putting my water down, but sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, a huge hundred foot long space and 50 foot wide space with two, um, what I say, um, wooden, it's like scaffold. And my idea was to have the audience in a sense be the set, you know, that you actually were, uh, you saw this crowd of people across from you and yet it had, so, so the space has a kind of epic quality, but, and yet you're very close to the performers. So the, the performing style had a lot to do with a very, not projecting, but just being in it centered, you know, neither projecting or pulling energy in, but just literally being there because some of the audience was seeing you very close. Mm -hmm. And yet the filmmaker, director, mentality, composer, I, I love that the audience was looking down at the piece because I wanted the airplane view of the piece and, and that you could see this gigantic space in some of the uh, sections. And then yet there were some sections that were very intimate. So, you know, in that sense, it was like long shot and close up within one piece. So, uh, you know, that, that live situation was very important to the piece. 
Uh, what do you think about New York City um, in, in general now? Did it over the years, decades change? Do you feel it is the, what, what, how do you experience it? Well, I think that what we did have in the in the 70s and the 60s, late 60s and, and 70s was a, a sense of community. Um, you know, we really, of all the arts, you know, because there weren't so many of us. So there was a, a you know, what we call the downtown world. And that was uh, people from across the board in terms of art forms, trying to push past the boundaries of those art forms. And there was a lot of communication between artists of uh, you know, of different art forms. So that was a, a, a beautiful time. Um, and then I think things changed a little bit in the 80s because uh, of the po political situation that it became a little bit more business-like and um, people were uh, thinking more about making money. I think when we came to do art in the, in those 60s and 70s, I mean, we did it for the love of it. And I, and, you know, we were able to survive on very little and doing other jobs and we were doing our work for the love of it not thinking that was going to be the way of earning a living and then uh, the 80s came and then the money thing came in and uh, you know the commodification of art came in strongly and so that shifted a little bit and then you know through the 80s and the 90s and now I feel that we're back to to square one in a good way that the young people that I know they're the love of making and the love of discovering and the love of creating and the only thing that I think is more challenging now is that it's harder to earn a living. So people, you know, in, when I came to New York, people were living in tenement apartments that cost $75 a month and you could live alone, which I, you know, really, which was, is very helpful uh, on one level. Now I think young people are living more in groups and, and sometimes that's a beautiful thing, like, you know, almost cooperatives, um, you know, to be able to survive. So that's very different, but it's pretty spread out. I think there's a sense of it being quite spread out. So knowing the, what the whole community is, is a little bit more difficult to, uh, you know, to get your hands on, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's pretty spread out in many ways. So mm. I think that's different. Do you think New York, uh, I'm sorry. It, it will be a, do you think it will be a rapture, a disruption for New York City? Will life be different? Uh, after Corona, will it maybe go back to a community, or do you think it will be just a pause and it will will be the same way as it was before? What do you oh, mean? I, I don't think it can be the same, and I do feel that people are really there's such an acknowledgement of of the love and care about of people for each other now, you know, and what we've meant to each other over the years, and 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 the young people, what they mean to us, and. I don't know, to me, it will never go back to what it was before and maybe for, for, the, for the better because I think value system wise, we were really going really down a bad path of, uh, you know, you, you know what this, I, I hardly have to say this, but you know, of greed, of violence, of, of uh, polarization, of, of hatred. I mean, it was just pathetic, you know, on, on a certain level. So I feel that hopefully this will bring people to their senses on this, you know, and that the, that we have a start, you know, that's that would be my big hope and start going back to what's really important in this world. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, you know, um, so I'm on West Broadway now. And when I first moved here, this was a very obscure neighborhood. There were just uh, one Teddy's restaurant, one coffee shop and three artists here and some spice factories. It was like a very industrial area. So that haunted quality of old New York, uh, you know, was very prevalent. And now it's Tribeca. So, you know, it's very, you know, it was yeah. but my other loft that I lived in before I moved here was um, on Great Jones Street. And I remember Broadway at that time. So that's like Third Street or Great Jones Street for people that don't know New York um, that well. You know, there were hardly even light bulbs on Broadway in those days. There was nothing. I mean, it was like completely dark, empty. People were living in lofts, you know, like, and it, they were factories. And now sometimes if I am going down Broadway, I, I, I don't even know where I am. It's like, um, you know, it's sort of like James Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life, you know, what happened to Tom's drugstore? You know, now it's a, now it's a, a you know, a gambling casino. I mean, it is so crazy, you know, with all these stores and, uh, you know, lights and everything. And so that is just, again, the natural principle of, of everything changes. 
but hmm. sometimes it's really hard to um, you know identify with it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I do. the world really <laughs> did, did change so dramatically, and especially for you who lived, and also in a way shaped it. We are um, in a way the world got smaller. We are connected uh, so so fast and through Zoom and uh, Skype and internet and email. Well, Radical changes. Yeah, that I think is a really positive thing. Like, uh, you know, the boundaries between nations are melting if we stay with this, you know, that the medical profession, they're communicating and, and everybody is trying to solve this problem. Truce in Yemen now, uh, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. amazing things are happening. There's, oh, there, yeah. uh, there's in uh, South Africa, the drug, uh, Dealers are now delivering food and and med medications to people rather than drugs. I mean, there's such a possibility that's coming up, and um, is, yeah. and I guess my prayer would just be that we don't go back to where we started and just that all this other impulse, you know, of human nature begins again. I hope that we just can keep some of the, these ideas uh, yeah. because we're working. You know, we're, we're literally the boundaries between all of us in the on the whole planet are melting and we're tiny, tiny, we're just tiny specks on this planet, you know, and just to think in those terms that we're so, we're so connected to each other and just the survival of the planet. I've just been starting to read Joanna Macy's work. She's an extraordinary environmental activist and also Buddhist practitioner. Oh, she's, you know, if anybody out there can just get any of her writing, it's just amazing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, she said, it, you know, it's like meditation on your feet. It's like, it's one thing to be sitting, but it's other thing. Uh, the other thing is that you're getting your hands in the dirt and you, you know, you're really working on something. We, I actually even have a piece in uh, Indra's net that's called hands in the dirt song. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that is important. Yeah, one, one of the artists from Taiwan yesterday said the first time the world is really connected. Comp yeah. it's, a, it's invisible, but we are now for, in the history of mankind. He, he said, but going back to the world that got smaller, but also it got smaller in a way that we are in our own small spaces. So in a way, it's, yeah. it's this paradox that uh, globally it's got smaller, so even though it's far away, but now yeah. we are in small spaces and are far away from the normal life we're in. So um, you, 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 you suggested that a bit earlier, maybe could we have a little look at your small space, at your life, at the mine is world pretty of big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mine is pretty big. Your big, your big West Broadway life. Uh, could, well, could we get you know, through the apartment, a little walk and- uh, Sure, I mean, that's, you know, I had to get over being very upset that I couldn't go to New Mexico, which is my kind of soul place. Um, but then I, you know, I sort of worked my way through that. And now I just wake up thinking how blessed I am that this space is so big and airy and open and, um, you know, I'm so fortunate. So I'll, I'll take you on a little tour that let me know if you can see this. So, yeah. So I since people, 1972. I, yes. And a lot of people are saying it's like a museum, which it probably is. Cause I don't, I guess uh -huh. people aren't working. So this is one little shrine. Can you see mm -hmm. that? Yeah. So I have these little shrines. So this is these uh, are friends and artists, or on the shrine. Uh, no, or? this is my teacher, and then also uh, people that have died, mm -hmm. and a Buddha, and you know, it's just like a little shrine. And then I'm going through the living room here, and then this is going towards the window. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to back back around, but I wanted to show you my turtle. Oh. Uh, and I can let's see. I, I this will see if I can manage with this crazy thing. Can you see see uh, this little cage? Yeah, yeah. And can oh, you see her? Oh. Yeah, what's her name? Neutron. Uh-huh. So. Hi, Amazing. my name's Neutron, but I, oh, not Meredith, she's had me for 42 years, but I don't even know who she is after all this time. <laughs> A little bit higher so we can see her face, yeah. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Oh, my God. For 42 years? Oh, yes. She's been my mommy for 42 years, but I don't even know if I even know, can recognize her because I only have a little brain. I see. And so do you look out on the street of New York from your aquarium? She does sometimes. Uh -huh. Can you can you give for our viewers from outside uh, maybe a little look on the, on the street? Sure, uh, sure. And the industrial rubber products uh, sign, which you have there. Can so what, what street are we looking at here? 
Uh, I'm on West Broadway and we're at the, the street um, that's catty corner to us is White's Yeah. 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 We, we lost your audio for a moment. So this is great. Great Jones. No, no. Uh, West Broadway. And... No, this. I, I'm on West Broadway, and we're looking mm -hmm. at White Street. White Street. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. Amazing. So as you can see, it is empty. A few people um, um, there, and um, notice the, the piece of plastic flag. floating. Notice the, notice the rainbow flag on White Street across uh, White Street yeah. restaurant. Yes. Yeah. 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 Incredible. So now I'm going to. I'll so get us. Yeah, let's get back yeah. in your apartment. Mm -hmm. So here is the. We're walking down. You know, for, through the uh, living room, and here we're going into the kitchen. I'll turn on the light. Uh -huh. Here's a kitchen, bathroom, in kitchen, bathtub. Mm -hmm. You see beautiful. that? Yeah, that's a beautiful ba Victorian kitchen. bathtub. Yeah. Yeah, bath. Bathtub in kitchen. And now this is the special place. This is the studio. Oh my God, that is so beautiful. And this is my piano. Uh huh. So every day that's where you rehearse, where you discover, yeah. where you. This is where I work alone, but this is also where we rehearse the ensemble. And there's been many, many pieces that have uh, been born here. You know, Quarry was born in this space. I mean, many, many. Uh, Many, many. What well, year was Quarry? Was it in 70? 76. 76, yeah. Um, this is where I sleep. Mm -hmm. So you sleep in your studio, in the place. You dream where all your works were born. Yup. My family on pictures. Mm -hmm. And um, this is another keyboard one, you know, for we were going to be performing with Bang and Can All Stars in their marathon, and we were going to use the this keyboard rather than a piano. Mm -hmm. And that's John Hollenbeck's drums. We were going to be doing a duet at the Big Ears Festival, and that was also canceled. And here's another shrine. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe if you go a little bit lo lower with the camera, we don't see the window. Yeah, tell me because yeah, I can't. Yeah, this, mm -hmm, yeah, that's perfect. That's good. Yeah, a beautiful shrine. So you, you really think of your friends and collaborators and family. In the Chinese tradition, ancestor shrine. So some of the people have died that are mm -hmm. here, uh, but mm -hmm. then you know some people are alive, like the Dalai Lama. And this is the Medicine Buddha shrine. Mm -hmm. What is that, a Medicine Buddha shrine? Um, well, you know, this is, again, this is all like, um, you know, kind of metaphoric. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, here's a mirror. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just more a kind of energy. Um, and then it's, uh, what would I say? It's um, manifest in a figure, but the figure is not, you know, it's just, uh, a manifestation of a certain energy and aspiration. Mm -hmm. So when you do that chanting, it's really more just invoking the energy of healing. Yeah, that's amazing. I have a hard time not asking you to chant or to sing, but I no. know we, we can't do that here, but maybe one day. And um, so, so what, what I wanted to show you, yeah, a, little, show I wanted to show you mm -hmm. a little bit of artwork that I, so this is a mm -hmm. beautiful piece by Anne Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to show you a beautiful uh, photograph that I love by Clemens Kalischer, who, uh, which, uh, so that is a photograph that he uh, took in, in um, 1947 of displaced persons. He was, a, he, he died recently. He was a very, very uh, brilliant photographer, you know, one of the best. Mm -hmm. Beautiful photo, so much love and that. So, are we still that, on? Yeah. Are we still on? Yes, I'm, we are I've still lost, on. I've lost the no. Image. Yeah, okay, maybe you have yeah. to go. Yeah, you're back. Yeah. And in the back is the kimono you have there. Uh, yes. Oh, let me. I can show you that. Is that? Can you see it? 
Yeah. So that came from Suzuki, the, the wonderful Japanese director. Uh, I performed, we performed Education of the Girl Child in the 80s at his uh, Togamora Festival in, in uh, Northern Japan. And mm -hmm. uh, everybody who participated in that festival, uh, he gave us, uh, uh, that's a performance kimono. Performance kimono, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good good thing to have, and uh, also in front of you, and to um, and to think. We got some uh, some questions here for our um, Siegel talks. One is from Alan Fisher, who says, "I admire Meredith's work for so many decades, and I've been lucky as an artist to work with her over the years." My question: How important is it to be daily informed, especially in these troubled times, or better as an artist to separate and envision a better world? I think I'm trying for a balance now. I'm not getting 100% caught, caught up. And um, I, I feel like it is important to, to know, to not forget what's going on, but uh, I'm trying to balance that and not just get obsessed by it. And then, you know, really give myself time to go into my imagination and, um, and, and just try to work on alternatives. And I, I'm just sending my love, love, love to Ellen Fisher, mm, who is yeah. one of the great, one of the most beautiful performers uh, uh, alive today. Thank you. Um, we have here a message from um, Noe Kuyar, who said, Dear Meredith, thank you for your continued transformative work. What is your response to the possibility of a more persuasive, mediated interaction between people through screens? as a result of this pandemic. Is it possible to transfer that kind of unmediated presence your work has so potentially, so greatly carried out through that years? Do you, do you feel um, there is a presence possible? I'm struggling with that right now. You know, as I said earlier, the, I've always believed so strongly in the live presence and the live performance as a form that you know, short of being in a church or, you know, that kind of gathering, you know, it has that possibility of the live energies. Um, so, so I'm, so I'm, so I'm a little bit because I, I'm just trying to figure that out. You know, I don't know, you know, that's something I'm struggling with right now. Um, you know, even yeah. knowing a number of years ago that maybe live performance was like a dinosaur. I always say, you know, sometimes I feel like a dinosaur uh, because everybody's so screen oriented. Um, I still would want to affirm live performance because I, I think that it's something that's, you just cannot, you, you just cannot substitute the screen for what happens on, you know, in live performance. But I feel like right now I'm just trying to contend with what happens if we, don't have a live performance. I mean, you know, I, it's, I'm struggling with it. Mm. No. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. for a while, think for a while, there, there, there was a, a there was a question a, within a, the Catholic within Church, the and um, uh, if the Pope's blessing will work, if you see it through television, or if you had to be on St. Peter's Square, <laughs> and wow. uh, the Church had to uh, had a big council with all their you know cardinals and whatever, but they came up with a solution that. You have to be there in person, but if you're too sick or you can't by any way get there, even if you wanted to, it does count. So uh, uh, it's uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a little guideline um, to, to, to think about it. And, um, and of course, you know, I, I, I do think the screens actually create uh, even more beauty for a live presence, like books are so precious and great now because we read so many electronic mails and things, which is great. We can write letters, we can write emails, we can write Instagrams. I'll be really writing a letter now means so much more. It's great to read books. And I think uh, performances live embodied on stage will even be more significant. But yes, also for that new generation, these children of the digital age, as we say it here at the Siegel and variation of Brecht's uh, dictum of the theater for the, his theater for the children of the technological age. Uh, yes, there will be also new forms that uh, will exist next to each other. And perhaps we can learn from Japan where they say, yes, we have Butu, we have no very old and something very new next to each other. And in 200 years, Butu will be an old tradition, but something new um, uh, will come up. Here's another question from London from Jonathan Petter. 
and he says he was in one of your voice workshops last year. Oh, the my Omega pals Institute. are asking questions. All my yeah, pals and, are. Oh, your friend, good. <laughs> uh, maybe they want to connect to you and this is your way of you know, giving something, as you said. It's important to hear voices from the artists and from you in the times of Corona we live in. He said, I wonder if you could say a little more, even you said already about it, about the arc of meditation practice over your life, so the arc, and how it has impacted your creative practice, the, so your meditation, how significant is it and would you suggest that artists should do that? Well, I think as a young artist, I intuitively was drawn to some of the principles that I learned later on were actual, actually basic principles of Buddhism. So- um, What principles, yeah. Well, a uh, space, uh, fluidity of time and space, presence, um, immediacy, uh, stillness, silence. Uh, you know, I think that those were part of my aesthetic. And when I was a young person, I think my, my art was everything. Um, I don't know if there would have been space for meditation and certainly was, there was not a lot of space for developing myself as a human being. So, I mean, I was pretty obsessed, but at a certain point in my life, a, quite a difficult point in my life personally, uh, I had been introduced to uh, Buddhism because I was teaching at Naropa Institute in the mid seventies. So, you know, and I had always been a searcher, you know, always a seeker. And uh, uh, the talks of Trungpa Rinpoche, you know, who was the teacher that started Nar Naropa Institute, uh, it's now Naropa University. I mean, I went to all his talks and, uh, you know, and they were amazing, but I wasn't ready at that time for like an organized anything and I was, skeptical and blah, 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 you know. But then uh, 10 years later, uh, I uh, was going through a hard period in my life and um, started reading some of his writing, um, you know, really applied to the suffering that I was going through. And so I started doing a real practice. And, you know, there's, and I remember some people saying, uh, you know, because the Western tradition has this myth that the more neurotic you are, the better artist you are, you know, as in cut off your own ear, kind of, you know, there's a tradition of the, uh, you know, that, that art comes from neurosis. Um, and so to think of maybe giving that up, you know, uh, doing practice, maybe I'd be, get all cleaned up and I wouldn't be able to do my art, but that is so not what practice is. Practice is actually going right to those those hard places and and leaning in on them and actually accepting them and working with them like working with every aspect of yourself so uh over the years i think i so i think the only difference and influence that it's had on my work is well i would say that it's had more influence on on me as a human being and and uh and being able to integrate my values as a human being and my values as an artist and not have this over here and that over there. That's been really wonderful. And also not being ashamed, you know, to say that you're making work that's a, a, hopefully a benefit to sentient beings. It wasn't hip to say that like in the old days of the intellectual old days because it was a very male dominant, dominated sensibility in the art world. Yeah. So I, you know, so I feel like it's, it's just been, uh, you know, so it's fed my work in, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, but I, but I, I didn't start there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I mean, we're getting a bit closer to, uh, to the end. I also know you have an, a call at once, so we're going to uh, shut on a, a little bit, only a couple of minutes, but um, we do ask um, our, our guests at the very end, you know, what, what, what advice would you give to artists, young artists, but perhaps with you also, for our listeners, um, or maybe for both, what, what would you say, how to, how, to, how to stay awake in these times, what to do, uh, how to use it, what to think about, is there something you can, as a person, well, as Meredith, Yeah, I would just say, you know, try to find the parts of your life that you really love and, uh, you know, and just affirm those, those, those parts of your, of your life, of what you do, it could be anything, you know, because I think that anything that comes from love, it, it, you know, nursing, making art, teaching, you know, anything that really 
that you love. It's so important to value that now. And then also you have a lot more to give to other people and uh, you know, also at this time. So, and then I think it's finding a balance between what you need to do yourself and what you need to do in terms of <clears throat> giving to other people. And, and, and just try to um, know that we, we will get through this in, in one way or another and also to not give up. Mm -hmm. To really not give up. Get, yeah, I think that's what we all have to say. We're not going to give up. You're not Just give up. keep on and, trucking. Keep on trucking. <laughs> and for a young artist, someone who's already, you know, uh, you think, should I really go in that career? It's so hard. And now the virus hits it. The next generation, the young generation, it will be more probably years of economic uh, downturn, of complications, of problems. What, what is your advice to um, there to always artists. were Frank it, there always were there always were. when we came to New York I mean it was so hard so I feel that the young people young artists should just take the time right now to do their work and to know that <clears throat> when this is over they will find a way you know I always say that to young people my students just follow your dream and don't let anybody tell you that you can't because you will find your way you know you if you follow that you're going to find your way. But if you don't follow that, you're always going to regret it. And you you know, that's very painful. I think now I would just say to young artists in this period of isolation to, to work, you know, just try to work, try to, to, you know, just do the work and be curious and start with no expectations whatsoever. In, even in terms of making work, like really dive in with no expectation, uh, no, um, you know, no, no knowledge, you know, it's, it's beginner's mind. Beginner's mind has a possibility, has all possibilities. Expert's mind means that you think that you know something, but I think we all don't know anything. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, you know, we're all living in the unknown. We're all suspended. And those moments of sus suspension are daunting and, and sometimes scary, but what an amazing thing that you could have those moments of gap of totally not knowing anything, you know, of, 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 of moving through your habitual response, habitual patterns and, and behavior. I mean, what a great opportunity. So even if you have moments of that, it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. No, no, that's this is, this is a serious and very um, significant, um, advice and I think you will have to know a lot to say that you don't know anything and you certainly do know so much and have done so much it's our uh, uh, great honor to have um, spent um, that time with you and I hope we will learn from it someone said uh, it is important to study history because you learn that people forget about history and um, and I'm with you I hope um, that this will remind us of the history of the arts uh, this is the Greeks and the theater and bringing people together and uh, that community is significant. And someone said it in our talks, uh, I think Valeria, that right now people are more important than the economy. They are more important than the production because now it's about our lives. So it's something very essential what we are living through. We really don't know what it is. We will only see it uh, when it um, um, comes uh, to us and 10 and 20 years later in documentaries where everybody seemed to know everything. But Meredith, thank you for giving us a, a view of your life, of thank your you so insights. Much. And, and uh, really, really, that was very moving and uh, real and very thank honest. Thank you. Thank you. And my love to everybody out there. Yeah, thank you. And if you have the time tomorrow, please do uh, uh, tune in. We have Aristide Tanag from the Burkina Faso, a great writer, director who in Africa did amazing work, was also at the Seagull, an actress also from there. And uh, to hear what what is, uh, um, what is going on next year. We hear a little bit more from also New York City. We will hear from Big Dance Theater, from uh, Nature Theater of Oklahoma, the Foundry Melanie and uh, Aaron Lensman. If it all works out, we will then hear from France and then also from India, um, from uh, Pakistan, Shahid Nandim and, uh, and, um, and others. So I hope you uh, will, will join us. So please all do stay safe, use your mask and stay tuned. Thank you so much. And thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, Thea, VJ, and the Seagull team, May, and uh, San Yang, and, uh, and Jackie. So um, thank you. And I hope you will join in. And Meredith, I hope we didn't steal too much time from, from you. Not at all. Bye-bye. Thank you. And thank you to Kristen for helping to set it all up. Bye-bye. Thank you Kirsten. so much. Bye-bye.